My house was right across the street from our high school. And instead of sitting in the cafeteria, everybody would come over to my place and have lunch. And they also knew that I was the guy buying all the new records. So over come over at noon, we would have a listen to whatever I had bought. One day, I had the new Rush record, Permanent Waves. And we cracked it open. I left it in the shrink wrap just for this occasion. Cracked it open and put it on the stereo. We started listening to it. The first song, side one, is The Spirit of Radio. And I'm reading the liner notes, and I go all the way through it. And at the bottom, there is a note that says, Dedicated to the Spirit of Radio, Alive and Well, Living in Brampton, So Far. And I realized that this was about a real radio station. I remember thinking, and it was a Wednesday afternoon. I know that. I, I just remember it. I remember thinking, one day, I want to work at that radio station. I was at Chum FM, and after uh, four years or so of free form playing the music I loved, uh, I, wa I was in the building, I was on the air at six or something like that in the evening, and, and the program director, the new program director, came up and said, here's your playlist. And I said, what's a playlist? Because I didn't think, I'd, I didn't know what it was, or so I wasn't ready to admit that I knew. And he said, well, this is the songs you're going to play tonight. And I said, no, no, I, we, I play whatever I want. And he said, well, not anymore. It dressed me. It, it you know, gave me my social life. I listened to the spots on the air, and I, I listened to the music, and those were the bands that I was going to see. Those were the clubs that I was going to. Those were the products I was going to buy. These were the people that were hanging on my wall as a teenager, you know, I've got goosebumps just thinking about it now. 102.1 CFNY, the spirit of radio. So six or eight months passed, and um, I got a call from the people who at that time owned CFNY. And I went to their offices, which were in Yorkville, beautiful offices, smashing, beautiful, you know, they had a grandfather clock there, it must have been worth 50 grand. And I thought, well, this is ideal. And they, after some negotiation, two or three days, they hired me to go out and be an announcer uh, doing the 7 to 11. So I went out to the little yellow house and I walked in and it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. It was filthy. The dirt was like this thick on the floors. Every chair only had three legs. It was insane. And I had just come from Chum of M, which was a very well-run organization. And I didn't know what to do about that. And I thought, I don't know, I don't really think I should stay here. And I almost turned around and walked back out again because it was, it was so bad. I thought, this is, not, this is not the place where I should be. Something said stay. I don't know what it was. Something just said stay, put up with it. One of the things that you have to understand about the old station was it was a secret. It was, at the very beginning, it was not on the CN Tower, it was a beam from the Caledon Hills, and it was just this weird radio station that you had to really work at getting. You needed a good stereo with a good antenna to be able to pick it up properly, and even then you couldn't find it in certain parts of the city because the signal was too, low, uh, too, too weak. Um, and the station was proudly anti-commercial. It was proudly anti-mainstream. Really, really early days in the Little Yellow House at CFNY, we were, we were playing some what is now considered, I guess, metal. I mean, we were the first radio station in Canada to ever play Black Sabbath or ACDC or any of those bands. And that's something most people, have to, well, they either didn't know or they've forgotten. Uh, mostly people didn't know because they said we only had 12 listeners. But that was originally where we went because nobody in, in Toronto was playing that stuff. And I thought, okay, that's what we're going to play. But then, Along came this thing called Q107. And so once they started playing that stuff, we really had to look for other things to play. And that w was about the time that punk and eventually New Wave were coming. That's the pistols were coming in and all that sort of music. Zenyetta Mondetta, police from CFNY and a canary in a coal mine. Pete Shelley before that, Do Anything, the Some Kind of Wonderful soundtrack. At the time, music was changing very rapidly from punk to new wave to techno pop in the early 80s. And um, there was no outlet for this music. Um, maybe you saw some of this music on, well, see, even at the time, much music didn't exist. 
Uh, you could maybe pirate MTV to hear about these bands that were coming out of the UK and you know this weird you know, video that you might see somewhere. Uh, not a lot of radio stations were, were championing this music, were playing this music. And, and when CFNY came along, it was like, you know, have you heard this? CFNY 102 Toronto and music from Talk Talk. It's my life by request and the day doesn't go by. We don't get a request for that song. It's about three years old now. It still stands well. Also Colorfield, that's new. It's called Running Away, exclusively from the It was spirit. playing essentially a lot of music nobody else would touch. Uh, some would eventually. As, as, uh, you know, a lot of these artists were being heard for the first time, became mainstream. But it was exciting to be at a place, or wanting to be at a place uh, when I first got in there that embraced music that I liked that nobody else plays. There's always the sun. Always, always. And in radio terms, there was nothing like it. There was a few. Back not in, in Canada. Days. But yeah, it was not all commercial. in the U.S. It was maybe one station in Boston and L.A. and a few... But that was about Maybe it, Chicago. Right? Yeah. Uh, but beyond that... There's nothing in Canada. No. Nothing even close to it. College radio, maybe, but nothing yeah. commercial. At the time, we didn't think it was different. At the time, we just were doing what we really thought was right. We were doing what we thought was, the, was going to be a competitive edge, because no one else, everybody else was playing their 300 songs over and over and over and over and over. And I had a rule that no song could play twice in a 24-hour period. Uh, and. In many cases, we had lunar rotation, I called it, where a song would appear once a month. Now, I hope that, uh, I hope you're feeling as good as I'm feeling tonight. Looks like it's going to be a nice Thursday evening as we spend it together here, you and I. Some of our friends, I hope you brought along some new ones. Marsden, CFNY FM, and you. So what is in your top ten? We don't have a top ten. You don't have a top ten? No, we don't even have a top forty. Really? How do you know what to play? Anyway, I spent an entire afternoon convincing this guy that what we were doing was the right thing to do. He finally said, okay, go ahead. But he just picked it apart because he was... All of the radio stations that fell under the Selkirk flag, they all followed the rules. They all followed the consultant's rules and blah, blah, blah. And... Uh, so there are times when you have to get up there and sell it, you know. I mean, it's, it's interesting that it, when you're in college or what does matter, when you're young, the one thing that nobody tells you is that all of your life, the, the greatest advantage you ever have is your ability to sell something, including yourself. I knew it was going to make it. New number one this week is The Cult from the Cool World soundtrack. It's The Witch on CFNY. We were still breaking music, which I think is a big part of, of CFNY's history. I mean, I was the first person to play Nine Inch Nails. I was the first person to play Nirvana's Nevermind and, you know, all of that you know, great Manchester sound that came out of the early 90s. And being, I was lucky enough because I was in the evenings, and evenings was often a testing ground for new material, something that we'd walk into the record peddler that day, which is a prominent record shop at the time, and they'd say, this just came in from London. you got to hear this. I'd grab that, I'd take it to the station, and it'd be on the air that night. If you hire somebody to be a music director, one or two, and I had two, you trust them to know what in the world they're doing. Ivor Hamilton was one of the music directors and Eddie Valiquet was the other. And they split it. it, one was domestic and one was international and that was the split. And they discovered all this music. And they'd bring it in and I, you know, nobody, nobody had ever heard of all these bands before. Nobody had ever heard of Depeche Mode until CFMY put them up. No one had ever heard of Costello, Joe Jackson, on and on it goes. We walk together, we're walking down the street. I just can't get enough. I just can't get enough. See, so Evan Y, the original import show with Ivor Hamilton and along with uh, Lee Carter. And uh, playing some of the records uh, that you uh, just brought back from uh, way back or way over there across the big pond. 
Uh, the Alarm is a really, really good record. They're a brand new record. Best yet. It's a, it's one that caught our attention here. We made our own hits, you know. We we chose the acts that we wanted to believe in and support, and and some of those bigger acts that you know were out there at the time. We just decided that they didn't need our help, you know. They were getting the help from everybody else in the world, so we we'll make our own hits. We'll find the new bands that we can support and. And you know there was lots of examples of bands that they would come and do, you know these new bands that would come to North America for the first time, and they would they would play you know they'd play like a small club in um, somewhere in the states. They'd play a small club in Detroit, and they would play a small club in you know somewhere else like Cleveland, and then they'd come to Toronto and they'd be doing a show at Maple Leaf Gardens, and or they'd be doing a show at the C and E or or you know a, a much bigger hall. So it was very impactful on what we were able to do to, to support new music. CFMY would play a song, uh, and they would do all the heavy lifting, um, making the song familiar to the audience. And then when the song reached a certain level of popularity, well then other stations would jump on it. And the station became known for breaking new bands. So when, for example, Martha the Muffins, Echo Beach came on, uh, you know, that was 1979, it was the Metro Music album, uh, CFMY played it, became a hit, then it gravitated to other radio stations, and uh, some people would say, oh, I've heard that, that CFMY played it. And we'd also get credit from record labels and from managers and from the bands themselves saying, you know what, nobody would play this band, play our songs before you did, so uh, you know, we're loyal to you. And, and anything that comes along, we will give it to you first. From nine to five, I have to spend my time at work. My job is very boring, I'm an office clerk. The only thing that helps me pass the time away is knowing I'll be back at Echo Beach someday. 19, I think 79, we put out a little self-produced single with two songs called uh, Insect Love and Suburban Dream. And they were, that station was incredibly supportive. And they said, we're going to play this. And we're going to play it at, you know, Sunday night at 7 p.m. And so we all got near the radio to hear that. And they did play it. And, you know, it was absolutely thrilling because... Uh, we had no idea that any station was going to play any of our music. The instruction was we listened to everything. They would bring it in, we would listen to it in my office, I'd put the turntable on it, and we'd listen. And we'd skip through the tracks, because we never eliminated any tracks from an album. An album had to be good all the way through or it didn't go in. Uh, and then we would vote on it. The three of us would vote yay or nay. And if it got a yay, then it went in. If it got a nay, then it went to listen to it one more time next week. Everything was given three chances before it was before it was excluded. Yes, it was the music, but you know, it's the personalities too, you know, and and, and the the personalities from you know, the time frame, whether that be uh, you know, uh, 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 the Pete and Geats who or the morning show or Brad McNally or the all night Andre to, to uh, 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 James Scott or Ron Bushell, the live world job, all those people, you know, people remember those, they still remember those, those jocks. I mean, you know, ask um, most people about, you know, who do you remember on, you know, a Q107 or a Chum FM back in those days. Most of the time what you'll get is most people will remember you know, a Roger Rick in Maryland, or they'll remember, um, you know, a brother Jake on a Q107, but you ask people about CFNY, they'll, most people remember just about everybody who was there all the time. So everybody kind of had, um, you know, their memories of each, you know, segment of, of what we did, did programming wise. Whenever I did an interview yeah. with any, um, a, a, with a person who was a prospect who joined CFNY, I never asked them questions like, could they do it? I never asked them questions like, what's your past experience? I never asked questions like, what university or college did you attend? I did ask questions that would lead me to find out whether or not they had the passion to do what has to be done, to do what we did at CFNY. That's all that ever, ever mattered to me. The, the other stuff to me is just bullshit. All that matters is, do I see passion in an individual's eyes? Do I think that they are going to just be prepared to work, 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 and do, 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 for only one reason, love. 
when you started going into radio stations or you started getting involved with record companies, you went, wow, a lot of these people, it's just a job for them. They might as well be selling Kleenex or, you know, toilet paper or something. Like, they just go, yeah, it's a job, you know, and we got this format coming out and blah. And you go, wow. And, and that even makes, you know, a, a, a station like CFNY even more special because they were like an island of radio where you went, when I listen to this guy, I know he really likes what he's playing. Being commercial radio, here's a place I could uh, be a part of cool music, play cool music, and get paid. <laughs> Which was wow. Really, okay, we didn't get paid a lot. Not a lot, though, that's true. Yes. Good because point. we, it was all about, it was all about being on a mission. Yeah. And uh, we were very, very enthusiastic yeah. about the mission. Yeah. We weren't making. Now, I'll tell we you. We had club gigs. We that had club. Well, yeah, yeah, and video road shows. Thank God for those. Yeah, right. Because that actually helped me with the rent a couple of months. But I was making. I'll tell you. Okay, I'll tell you what happened when when uh, I was when I came here. I was music director at a radio station in Winnipeg, mm. and I was working five days a week and making twenty three thousand dollars a year, which is more money than I'd ever made in my life. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I had a nice apartment, all the rest of it. I came here to do all nights, five all nights every week, plus one Saturday morning for $17,500 a year. <laughs> so again, they may have back then exploited our youthful exuberance. <laughs> That's how I hired everybody. Or there was Martin Streak, and, and we all know Martin. I don't know if you've met him or not, but he's a pretty high energy guy. And uh, he was a high energy guy right up until the end. And he, he sat in my office and it was just, and I was only looking at him as uh, originally as the guy who was going to drive the truck, this five ton truck. I still remember that when he got it, he finally got his, whatever they call that license and the chauffeur's license or whatever it's called, so he didn't drive a truck. Uh, and, and, and he came running, I heard him run up down the corridors and see everyone screaming, I got it, I got it. He was beside himself. He was so excited. And, and there's a guy who started doing, he was the guy in charge of the road shows and he had a crew of three or four people with him at all times. The road show was out three or four nights a week. It was busy, busy, busy. And uh, he turned that into what he really wanted to be, and that was a guy on the radio doing incredible shows based on music. Thursday 30. Cake before that, the album is called Fashion Nugget. The Distance is the track we heard. That's sitting at number 22, down six positions from last week. Thursday 30, Martin and Pete, keep in mind. There, there's a club, it's not there anymore, Andy's Pool Hall over on College. And uh, I, I was doing DJ work there on Wednesdays just for the fun of it. And uh, in came Marty, and he came up on the DJ stand, and we hugged and carried on. And uh, I hadn't seen him in a while. Uh, and he whispered in my ear, I've just been fired. And I thought he was joking. And I pulled, we pulled back, and I looked at him, and I said, are you serious? And he said, yeah, I've just been fired, and I don't know what to do. And I said, what do you mean you don't know what to do? And he said, you're the only guy that have ever interviewed me for a job. I don't know how, how to do it any. We had planned to get together for coffee in, in the next three or four days, and, and of course the next day he left us. Uh, uh, people ask me why. Why would Martin have done what he did? Uh, and the answer to me is really simple. He didn't know who he was anymore. He lost his identity. His identity was Martin Streak on the radio playing music, and suddenly it wasn't there. And uh, he'd been doing that for what twenty years or something. So when you lose, when you when you're when you're totally immersed in what it is we do, when it's gone, you don't know who you are for for, for a while. You have to find yourself again. Regardless of how commercial you want to take you know, this format, I think there needs to be an element of, of acknowledgement for its past and why it is the way it is now and why it's so important to the history of Toronto and, and the world. At that time, it never occurred to any of us that we'd still be talking about it in 2014.
15, whatever year this is. We never occurred. We weren't doing it for that reason. We were just doing it for what, we, what we've been talking about, which is just the love and the passion to do it. But we never, it never occurred. I'm sure Ivor Hamilton, I'm sure it never occurred to him that someday he'd be the vice president or a vice president at Universal Music. It just, that wasn't what we were just doing it. I still am, I, I read the, the, the Facebook and email wherever else, and I'm still just absolutely humbled and amazed that people are still talking about it. We're Progressive FM, you can't call us mainstream. The only real radio, Versa is a big machine. Those little whispers start to shake the floor. And the noise can be heard from the corporate doors. Because it's a hit But we love new 